Krishna our Lord, Krishna our love. The transcendental entity of Sri Krishna and his appearance in the form of Lord Chaitanya, the instructor of the world, is completely beneficial for everybody to hear about. He brought his most wonderful qualities of Krishna into focus. And of course, each and every one is backed up by many stories and by many uh, Bhagavatam shlokas. Anyhow, we just meditate on them because it's quite a lengthy list. You know, Krishna is unlimited. In his form of Vishnu, he has 1,000 names which are chanted in the Vishnu Sahasranam. But the glories of Lord Vishnu are being chanted by Ananta Shesha with millions of mouths since time immemorial and has not been able to finish this. Just to give you an idea how glorious the Lord is. Well, how glorious love is. And the Supreme Lord is love personified. So let us hear about his wonderful qualities. Krishna is possessed of an unlimited intellect. All the intellects in the existence, they're included in it. And his goes beyond it unlimitedly. Just imagine what kind of an intellect is that. We can see that some people in this body have quite an intellect. Even teeny little souls. Quite an intellectual capacity, a way of speaking, and so sophisticated. And nevertheless, the sum total of all intellects is but a fraction of Krishna's intellect. Somebody said, Krishna is unlimited. What does it mean? Somebody said, how is it possible the Supreme Lord is confined within an atom? Is he a prisoner inside the atom? And the answer was given, no. The Lord, he can take a walk inside the atom for one million years without reaching the other side of the atom. So with our little peanut-sized brains, we cannot understand the infant. It's simply incomprehensible. How wonderful he is. So, and if any intellect ever shows up in any one of us, anything beautiful, some poetic capacity, or like that, that only shows how generous Krishna is. That he's also giving us some intellect. Now, please don't forget that this intellect is given to us to serve him, to embellish his loving domain, which means to embellish the spreading of his love all the time. <laughs> then, actually, we can, with full satisfaction, feel that this intellect <clears throat> is a gift of Krishna to increase the harmony. Otherwise, our intellect is a great Jeopardy. Our intellect drags us away from the truth. It makes us antagonistic, skeptical, speculative, calculative. Our intellect is not necessarily very friendly, predisposed, but when we are coming in contact with Krishna through his holy name, all this can change. And we can actually enter into the realm of appreciation of the unlimited intellect of our Lord. Krishna is inaccessible to sensuous knowledge. Atasi Krishna Namadina Bhavitram 
The senses cannot understand Krishna. But if he wants to reveal himself to his devotee, he is obviously quite capable of doing so. So, it's very important to understand that my senses belong to him. He has given the senses to me so I can serve him and develop a loving attachment towards him. Krishna is the Lord of the infinity of worlds. Lord Brahma with four heads was surprised when he was asked, which Brahma are you? Later he found out that there are unlimited amount of Brahmas. Just again, just like Lord Krishna's creation is unlimited, so it would also be unlimited. What he's doing in the material realm, not only in the spiritual realm, even within the material realm how, how, realm, how can we conceive of any limitation? Just if you are in abstract consideration, make a straight line. And you see a straight line and extend it to either directions. How can you conceive of an end to come to it? Because even if there is a wall or a barrier, that can only be a physical wall. So beyond the physical wall, space must go on. We cannot conceive of the end of space. We cannot conceive of the end of time. So what is this? What's the meaning of that? It's the meaning that we all belong to the Supreme Lord who is so incredibly great that our teeny little senses can only get mesmerized by his infinite kindness. No, 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 no. Nothing else we can say. Nothing else we can do. Is this the Lord's plan? To make such a gigantic creation and position each and one inside of us to try to find out what is our relationship with him. You know, I am not interested in my relationship with the Venus or Saturn. Okay, okay. they have influences even on me as we know from astrology. But I'm not interested in the Milk Street. I'm not interested in all the wonderful, spectacular galaxies the Hubble telescope has discovered. I'm not interested in it. I don't want to go there. I don't want to explore. Like in this world we hear, oh, there's a nice lake somewhere. We want to go and see, right? There's a beautiful mountain cave. Oh, let's go and see. We are curious about seeing some spectacular sights. And the world surely has a lot of them. Everywhere there is something marvelous. But when I look into the sky at night and see the incredible space and considering that this is all the world of matter, I tell you, I, I'm not becoming curious. I don't want to go to all those places. It will take me an infinite amount of time just to find out about the fraction of the creation. So it, it looks like too time, uh, time taking. So what do I want then? I want you, my Lord Krishna. I want you and what you want me to do. I want to have no my eternal relationship with you. I don't need my relationship with, with everything else. Unless it has to do some with you, of course, then I will welcome it. But I consider it as a top priority for me to establish my relationship with you. And since you already say here, the <laughs> sensuous capacity of having a relationship with you, that is not, it's not a valid approach to gain 
any entrance into your dominion, then I conclude very humbly and happily, please make me an instrument of your love. Please do, do not let me waste away my existence in this material world. Krishna is the Lord of the infinity of worlds. Everywhere you are Lord, every place, every atom you are Lord, every planet you are Lord, every galaxy you are Lord, every universe you are Lord, you are the Lord of all Lords. And not because you are exerting your military power and prowess over the others. You are the Lord because you are the creator and maintainer of everyone and everything. How can we conceive of your greatness? It is incomprehensible how such an incredible creation could ever come into existence. Most amazing, most enchanted, that is you, the Lord, the Lord of love, the Lord of life, the Lord of everything. It's only you who I want to reach. I want to be in connection with you. I need that. There's nothing else for me to do. The rest is waiting for death. And death will come, and then I will go, and then I will be again in the same situation, <coughs> lost. Like every one of us is lost, lost in this world. Yeah, we may have a house, we may have a car, we may have a nice family, we may have. Most people don't even have that. Hmm? But that does not mean nothing. It gives nothing. We are lost in this world, birth after birth. I don't want to be lost anymore. I want to know where I belong. And I want to do what I'm supposed to do. And I don't want to be rebellious. And I'm amazed. My Lord. Oh, my Lord. You are. You are. And you are my only. Therefore, I put my case into your hands. I have the audacity to claim. Since you have created everything and me including, position me somewhere where you're pleased with what I'm doing. I'm material at your disposal now. I don't want to... Be, can you imagine? The Lord of Lords exists and you rebelling. I mean, imagine that, you know. This is just a pretty mad position. Now, somebody has created the whole world and wants you to do a certain thing and you say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to go after my things. You don't bother me. You don't come with all your laws on me. You don't pressure me. You don't put me in anxiety with, your, with all your stuff, no. I'm going to do my own thing here in this world. And I'm going to be the enjoyer. And I'm going to be the controller. And I'm going to be the center. I mean, that's in one way or another what we are doing here. Because we are just not cooperating. We are just so-called so troublemakers. And how much troubles we can make? Well, that's a lot. Of course, within the infinite, like one interesting thing, you can only serve Krishna. If you don't serve Krishna, you still serve Krishna because in, indirectly you're serving, you're complying his karmic action-reaction principle. That means maybe you're a nasty guy, so you give somebody some trouble, and it means he's suffering the karmic uh, reaction which he's supposed to uh, suffer, and you are the instrument. So you're again through the energy of the Maya control, you're still serving God. Nobody can say, I'm not serving God. I'm away from God. I'm doing what I want. I'm in charge. I'm in control. Never. So what is the situation then? That is a question whether you want to serve Him, whether you want to be submissive to Him. How can you argue with God? 
It's the most silly proposal. Of course, some people say, well, I don't believe in God. I don't know where God is. I doubt that these revelations which we are dealing with, like Bhagavad Gita, Shima Bhagavatam, are really of complete, pure origin, of complete, pure direction towards the right thing to do, etc. So I may raise those, those questions, those doubts. It's one of the gifts God has given to me. I can doubt anything and everything. But the reality of the creation is there. You, don't, you cannot doubt creation. You cannot doubt individuality. You cannot doubt your thirst for love. You cannot doubt the wonderful influence of light. You cannot doubt the tremendous power of sound. You cannot doubt the potency of serving with your hands. With your hands you can experience sensual touches and you can also experience heart devotional service labor of love it's all in the capacity of your hands all the senses we have the knowledge acquiring senses and the executing senses they're all powerful instruments given to us by God in his kindness to utilize them for him to inquire about him, to sing his praise, to watch his deity form, to smell the flowers offered to him, to jump in the kirtan, to play the midanga in the cartels with our hands, to pick, pick the tulasi leaves, to make an offering to the Lord. Hmm? It's all incredible, the, the instruments. Otherwise, what are you going to do with your instruments? Just running around doing nonsense, huh? Touching what you're not supposed to touch, smelling cocaine, uh, watching pornography, tasting meat, uh, dancing in the disco, kicking people, oh, using your hands to steal. Oh, no, 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 no. These senses, if they are not dovetailed to the service of the Absolute, they merely go mad. When you're in rebellious position, you're kind of a dangerous some, 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 some strange fellow running around in this world meeting other equally strange fellows and each one of them checking each other out hmm, this one I can steal, I can lie I can do this, I can do that horrible let me tell you what is horrible each and every one of the countries and the people and the families and the cities always trying to take advantage of each other very little sincerity do you find in this material world. So, it's time to worship the Lord, the infinite Lord of love. It's our time now. And here we are hearing about how wonderful is Krishna. Next one. Krishna wields the power of creating the unlimited. Krishna is creator. By his sweet will he creates. Some people say when Lord Vishnu enters in Nidra Yoga, then he inhales and all the universes are destroyed. Everything merges into his body. Everything just disappears all around. And then after he inhales a while, a few million billion years, and he exhales again. And everything comes back into creation, into existing. Powerful breathing, no? Mm -hmm. And he's just glancing over the creation. Everything goes... He's glancing. He's impregnating matter by his divine glance. And 8,400,000 species with all their designs are impregnated into the coding system of this world. Actually, it's pretty interesting to see how much science has discovered about the coding, the coding system. Nowadays, our world is a bit sophisticated. Don't forget, in the times of Darwin, they would consider that the cell was just a little speck of carbons, uh, which could not be very complex. Nowadays, we know everything quite different. The cell is 
more sophisticated than an entire city. And you have trillions of, of them in your body. No, no way to count how many cells you have. Trillions. <laughs> and each one of them works with a code. And the code from top to bottom is coordinated in the body, in, in any unit. Whether it's you or a crocodile. From the last tip of the tail to the tooth, everything is coordinated within one coding. Hmm? It's called the crocodile coding. Huh? And then the particular temporary karma crocodile coding, <laughs> which lasts exactly until he dies, and then he is going to be put into a new coding system, the next genetic code. I mean, it's just amazing. I mean, you just have to see the creation, and you've got to get odd, odd. No, my Lord, I give up. I give up. And so, okay, scientists have endeavored to discover it, and they were allowed to get a glimpse into it. I mean, ever since the beginning, even when you look in the sky at night, you also get the same type of glimpse. As if you look into the microcosmos or the mac macrocosmos, by the Lord, by the Lord's sweet will, you get a glimpse. Do you need to see the genetic code to admire God and His creation? Is the sun rising in the morning not enough to see His unlimited powers always at our disposal, always kindly uh, warming up our existence, bringing water from the ocean? <laughs> It's by the sun that the water comes from the ocean. Otherwise, we would be just a big desert and all would die. But because nicely preserved salt ocean is being emanating all through the clouds, very nice, clean water. It used to be nowadays. Everything is pretty adulterated by the chemical contamination of pollution. But it used to be like that. And then everywhere in the world, the rainfall would fall down and... The water was contained in, in an under level of the ground because why? If the water is not contained in the under level, then it evaporates. So in order to have nice storages of water, it must be under water, under land. So you would say, well, if there's water under the land, then you would expect the land is just going to uh, dissolve, no? Because that's what mud does in the water. It dissolves. No? So you think, so if there's water under here, why the earth on top is not dissolving? Well, this is all Krishna's mystical arrangement. And then it comes up in little wells or, uh, or in little um, offices on the mountains here and there, little rivulets go back to the ocean. So what an incredible, beautiful, beautiful system is this. So now we know the genetic code and we can be even more surprised about the microcosmos which we had so little awareness of. Hey, wait a second. So little awareness if you don't read the Bhagavatam and accept it. Because in the Bhagavatam already a description is given of the atom and the time calculated by the atom. And there's been, it, it's all been said. Nothing new has been discovered by science. In the codes of the Vedas, everything has been revealed. Krishna says, all the elements in this world, they, been, they are coming connected to me, Dananjaya, as little pearls on a thread. It's all one string. So, what is a genetic code? It's a string of information connecting one to the other. Super string. And all these kind of modern theories are alternative worlds or simultaneously other worlds existing. All this is in the Vedas. Krishna carries the impress of limitless power. So he is there. He's always there. There's no way of conceiving conceiving any type of limitation on Lord Krishna. Not possible. That's why the impersonalists and the atheists, they make a great blunder when they say God is not this. 
How can they tell? What is their authority? The Lord is unlimited. He's this and that and everything. He's anything he wants to be. Even we are also part of God. But foolishly sometimes we think, oh, that means we are God. Because that's a kind of an atheistic influence. Now we say, okay, we are parts of God. Great. So we are God. But we just forgot that we don't create anything. We don't maintain anything. We don't even know how our own body works or anything. We can't even maintain ourselves. And then we go around and follow philosophy. We are all God. It simply means you, you have lost your, your, your senses. God is the one who has the unlimited power. Because he has unlimited power, therefore, he is worshipped by all. He is the most blissful Lord of love. Then he must be worshipped. What other relationship are you going to have with God except worshipping him with love? Hmm? Tell me, what else are you going to have? It's not, it's not reasonable, is it? Krishna is possessed of inconceivable potency. Inconceivable means you can't conceive it. Okay? You see the macrocosmos? You see the microcosmos? Now what? Shut up and worship. Chant, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. Divine Supreme Feminine Energy of Love, Hare. Divine Supreme Lord of Love and Enchanter of the Enchanters. Hare Krishna. And then you are enchanted again by her, your beloved Radhika. All so much enchantment, I also feel enchanted by you. <coughs> And therefore I want to serve. That's all. <clears throat> Otherwise you're inconceivable. You can create granite. You can create marble mines. You can create humans who go there and carve out of the marble the most beautiful things. You are creating teeny little seeds which produce beautiful fruit trees. Which gives the fabulous mangoes every year. You are, you are inconceivable. means don't try to understand it. You can't. You are not entitled to understand God. He's inconceivable. He has inconceivable powers and potency. Brahman, that's just one of them. Paramatma is just another one. Vaikuntha is another one. Unlimited Vaikuntha. And Goloka Vendam, that is a special place. Again inconceivable. Again unlimited. Unlimited love. In Goloka. It's really time to understand. It's our time to worship. It's our time to preach. It's our time to feel the joy of having our Lord. It's our time to share with us. It's our time to be kind. The only approach towards Him is doing what He pleases. And He reveals us in the Bhagavad Gita. You will not find to my limited understanding any more trustworthy source of information on how to behave in this human form of life, than this manual of humanity, the Bhagavad Gita, as it is. Of course, the same truth may also be extracted from other parts. The truth is the truth, love is the truth, service is the truth, being kind to others, being honest, and all this, all these considerations, they are all part of truth, and it doesn't really matter where you get them from. The important is that you come to that conclusion. 
But here the Bhagavad Gita is spoken by Krishna himself. The Supreme Lover says, Man manaba man patuma judge man namas guru. Always think of me, become my devotee, become intimate with me, come with me, go with me, come to my world, don't go back to this material world. He's giving even a description, he's given a map of the universe. Abrahma Bhuvana, Lukapur, Namavati, Nojuna, from the highest to the lowest part of this world. It's all waste of blood time. You're all going to be dying again and again. Get out of here, come on. If you think of me at the moment of death, I'll come, I'll get you out of here. Think of me, become my devotee, surrender to me, give up all other type of considerations, speculation, religions, traditions, whatever rituals you have, give it all up, just surrender to me. Become the servant of my devotees. Lord says, if you think you're going to become my direct servant, he's going to say, no, I don't accept that. You should become the servant of my devotee. Servant of my devotee is a real devotee. So everything is answered. And the whole invitation of Krishna is just love, love, love and love again. Love in service, love in life, love with family, love with everybody. There's no hypocrisy permitted. Everything is just incredible. So you... I don't find anything else like this in this world. That's why I'm so happy about following the principle of Krishna consciousness. Despite the hardship and the difficulties it, it entails. Because like to try to be a devotee in this world of, you know, just like I was just in Calcutta. I mean, I've never seen as many billboards in my life as in Calcutta, you know. You can look anywhere without looking at least at 50 billboards. The whole city is billboarded up. It is so horrible. Buy this, smoke this, do this, buy. Blah, 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 blah. I mean, it's everywhere. I mean, the whole world is a bit like this. But in it, Calcutta was extreme. You couldn't see anything but billboards. <laughs> All of them telling you what you should do, what you should buy, why should you should work like an S, so you can do this and you can do that. Hmm? So. We want to serve your interest, my Lord, and not the interest of all these billboard makers. We want to be your servant and not the servants of our senses, of the illusion. This is our humble prayer. Krishna is unborn. Amazing, no? The unborn appears in the womb of Devaki. Yes, that's what, who's Krishna. You better figure that one out. How the unborn is born. Very logical, right? You're understanding everything, huh? And when he appeared as Ram, his mother's Poshalya. And when he appeared as Kapila, his mother is Devahuti. When he appeared as Goranga, his mother is Sachimata. And he is the unborn. Yeah. Congratulation. So you also believe in this cult, which gets people to believe the unbelievable, the supreme and absolute contradiction. They're calling somebody who was just born from the womb of Sachimata the unborn. We have to first of all accept if we are approaching Lord Krishna that we are not entitled to question him. We are not entitled to understand him. We are just entitled to worship. And we can also worship all his wonderful contradictions. The unborn <laughs> what does it? What does it mean? How can you assimilate such a statement? There was a birth ceremony for the unborn. There was a name-giving ceremony for the unborn. Because he is not confined to the material existence of birth, old age, disease and death as everybody else. He appears. Therefore, Within the realm of faith, you understand, he is not born. He appears at his sweet will, you know, 
when Krishna was just born from Mother Devaki, he appeared in his full form to her. And she was very, very scared of him. Not, not scared of him, scared for him. She says, oh my God, if Kangsa sees you like this, he's going to kill you right away. She was so confused. And, oh, oh, oh. So please become a baby again. <laughs> so whatever Krishna does at any time, anywhere, is totally beyond what people can expect. When he shows his universal form, he shows that he is not restricted, he is not limited at any time by anyone. He is the underlying principle of every atom which exists. So if he decides, I want to appear somewhere, he does that and he remains the unborn. Because he existed a long time before anything else existed. But some devotees were so much in love with him, they wanted him to become their son. So he said, okay, I'll do it. For you, I'll do it. You're so special. Such a loving devotee. Next time I, I incarnate somewhere, you'll be my dad. You'll be my mom. I'll play around with you as a little baby on your, sh on your lap. What is that? That's love. It's inconceivable. That Lord of Lord of Lord, that the one becomes a baby and, and sits on somebody's lap and cries and plays like a baby, his baby pastimes, so enchanting, sweet pastimes. Little Gorang, baby Kupat. Drive everybody crazy with love. What? Well, the most fortunate ones. Usually we are just crazy with lust. But there is some way of becoming crazy with love. And this is by following those who are crazy for love. Who know have nothing else in their life except that. So this is the story of the unborn. Krishna solves all heterogeneous views. All varieties, all different opinions, they all become in Krishna's realm one very sweet, harmonized issue. Unity and diversity, you can also call it. The Lord is everywhere and He is also nowhere. I'm everywhere. I'm the biggest. I'm the smallest. It's very nicely explained in the Ishupanishad, where Krishna says, if you want to approach me, first of all you have to accept that I'm independent, I can do whatever I want. I'm not supposed to be questioned. I'm everywhere and I'm nowhere. Can you accept that? No, sorry. That's too much. If you ask me to accept that, I'd rather go back to my mother. And don't study the Vedas. Because you are you're very contradictory. Very complicated. I cannot do that. Okay, then you go back to your mother. If you want to study the Vedas, you first of all have to accept the Lord is absolute and is always to be attended by the thoughtful devotees with great affection and always approaching his love with, <clears throat> with a prayerful mood. That's really what it is all about, spiritual life. A prayerful mood. Oh, please, my Lord. Not an angry mood, not a challenging mood. A prayerful mood and service-like, ready to serve. So therefore, if there's any contradicting ideas, everything is harmonized within the Supreme Lord. He solves all different kinds of speculations, antagonistic attitudes. You see this world, Krishna unites, Maya divides. 
That's the same idea. As soon as you come in contact with Krishna, it's just like when the sun appears, we all get warm. Hmm? Equally warm. And we also get light. And Krishna is a very, very powerful solver of disputes. But you have to turn towards him for having your disputes solved. Okay? Do not speculate. Just follow Sri Krishna and Sri Guru and you'll be safe. Krishna is vanquished by exclusive devotion. Oh, my God. Krishna is vanquished. The same one we are just talking about, who's unborn, unlimited, and uh, undying, and then, and then, and then, and then. Now he's vanquished. That's good one, no? Krishna is vanquished. Vanquished means conquered. He is put under control. Vanquished is almost a military term. It means subdued, put into his place. Radharani says, Krishna, not going to see you again because you have lied to me. Krishna says, no, please forgive me. It's a misunderstanding. Krishna prays for her love, cries for her love, becomes mad for her love. Krishna is vanquished by love. When a devotee loves him, <laughs> this is this is one line. This is the whole secret of bhakti yoga. If you can understand it, you'll become a devotee right here now, and you never stop it. You can't understand it. You think we are crazy. God is vanquished by exclusive <laughs> If you have the if you serve him with love, he'll be yours. Prabhupada was one of such devotees. He went to the West and he told Krishna, I have no devotion, I have no knowledge. Oh, they called me Bhaktivedanta over there. Now if you want me to do something, do not, <laughs> do not uh, become a failure, do not give a bad name to you, so you better do something about it. Make me dance like a puppet. Make me dance as you will. Fulfill the meaning of your guru, of your the devotee's desire. I have no business here in this place, but you seem to have some business because you sent me here. Otherwise, why do you keep me, get me out from Vindavan? So it's up to you now. <laughs> it's a very, very loving, loving connection. There are some expressions. And then you see how it transforms, no? Krishna transformed, Krishna touched the heart of the, the Mlechas so they could say, Prabhupada mesmerized us. You could say, like some people say, he enchanted us. Well, what's the enchanter? There's a story in Germany of a guy who came and he offered to the people in the city that he would take away all the mouse and rats from the city because the city was suffering under the siege of so many of those animals. They said, oh yes, you do that? Good, good, good. Please do it, we'll pay you. So he started playing on his flute and all the mouse and rats went with him out and he took them away. And then he came back and they said, Oh, the rats just left by themselves. We don't have to pay you anything. <laughs> they were rascals. So they said, okay, no problem. So he played again on his flute and took all the children with him. They all followed him. Interesting story, though. No? So... 
Lord Krishna, when he plays on his flute, he takes all of us away from this material world. No? And if you want to cheat him, then he's also going to take you right into the Maya world. If you, you know, Krishna's power of his chanting flute, his enchanting flute, is very, very special. It's the flute of love. But if you don't want to hear it, then you're going to get, going to get some techno music mm -hmm. instead. And then you go somewhere and you go, and then you think, oh, now I got the substitute for the divine flute. Jumping like a mad puppet. <coughs> so, Krishna is vanquished by exclusive de devotion. This, this sentence alone should drive us mad, should let us fall on the ground and cry and cry and cry and cry. If our hearts only would be soft enough. Vanquished by pure devotion. <laughs> God, God, the creator, is vanquished. As a matter of fact, he's addicted to that pure devotion. He's, he wants that. As a matter of fact, he has given you your loving capacity so that you can reach to real devotion. Exclusive devotion. The word exclusive is exclusive. People like to have exclusive stuff, right? They want to have exclusive dresses, exclusive jewelry, exclusively beautiful people in their surroundings. Everything they want to have exclusive. And Krishna, what does it mean exclusive? It means there's not much of it. It's something special. But Krishna, he is only vanquished by this exclusive devotion, <laughs> which is the purest and most focused of all consciousness, most special, most loving. Yes. Exclusive devotion is the goal of our life. Not a cheap thing. Nothing. You can buy exclusive dresses, exclusive cars. You can join exclusive clubs if you are included. Exclusive. It's not so easy available, no? But to have exclusive devotion, dedication, commitment, means only to Krishna. You don't give your love and devotion to anybody else. Wait a second. To any Maya. Because exclusive devotion to Krishna means love for all. So it's not something, oh, now he's only eyes closed and he's just saying, Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. And somebody says, hello, don't disturb me. Krishna, 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 Krishna. Not like that. Exclusive devotion means exclusive love to Krishna in every moment, in every circumstance, to everybody, to everybody. This is something extraordinary. That is the love we've seen in our spiritual master. They had, my gurus, they had exclusive devotion. And they gave us their love from their exclusive devotion. Exclusive devotion means you're not sidetracking. You're not going away saying, okay, I'm taking a vacation now in the, in the Bahamas and so please don't disturb me. I'm just going to do other things. Nothing to do with devotion to Krishna or devotional service. It's not possible. That's why devotees have no vacation. They have no weekend. They have no stop to devotional service. It doesn't fit together with devotion. Mother never has vacation being mother. So why a devotee should have vacation being devotee? Then his love would not be more special than any mother's love for her little baby. That wouldn't make the devotion very exclusive, right? There's lots of mothers out there. Not only human mothers, there's animal mothers. I don't know how strong the attachment is between cockroaches and their offsprings, but I know the attachments between some animals and their offsprings is extremely intense. 
very affectionate. Just yesterday, when we went up to clean some some area, we saw there were three monkeys. It was in the middle of the day. And they were just sitting there hugging each other. But they hugged each other. They were not uh, impatient. They were sitting and hugging each other at least for an hour. And they were not lusty. They had no, there was no sex. It was a mother with two children, more or less, or something like that. But they, they hugged each other like Oh, beloved one, so happy to have you here with me. And sometimes, I mean, absolutely affectionate. If they were not having an affectionate hug with each other, then then there's no affection anywhere anyway. So, there's not a human prior, uh, that only humans can have affection. It's crazy. So if that affection is there so strong, then can you imagine how much affection is in the infant, in the Lord of Love? Oh, Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. It's an absolute ecstasy of love. An ocean of ecstasy of love. That is Sri Krishna. And therefore, he's only vanquished by exclusive devotion. Nothing but devotion. Krishna is the inner guide. Well, that's also an incredible thing. Krishna is the inner guide. Krishna is in the heart of everyone. Krishna is, Krishna is the one who cares for you. Krishna is the one who brings you here. Why are you not running away from Vrindavan? Why are you not running away from your spiritual master? Why don't you go out and get drugged and, and mug people and get money and buy things? Why don't you do that? Because somebody inside tells you don't do that. Somebody inside you, in a guy, tells you stay with the guru, stay with the principles. Don't follow your mind. Don't do the things which the material world proposes. No. Stay with it. Stay with it. Stick through with it. Become a good devotee, take responsibility, don't fail on the Guru, because if you fail on the Guru, he can't do much with you. He can only do th things with people who are reliable, right? You want to publish a book, you're going to rely on somebody. You want to even edit one text properly, you have to rely on somebody. He has to be very meticulously cautious that there's no mistakes. Everything. Somebody constructs a house for you. It has to be very meticulous. So the thing won't fall in. So you have to have an expert on this, an expert on that. Give somebody a machine. He has to be very meticulous not to push the wrong buttons. The other day, one devotee by accident, he pushed the wrong button and he, he deleted all the files we had in our office just because he was stupid. Hmm? He wasn't careful. Because in the computer world, it's like that. Somebody that asks you, do you want to delete it all? You say, what's strange? Why this stupid computer always asks me questions? So you just go, bang. And you don't say, but whether so you say yes or you say no, that's a world of a difference. <laughs> so he said yes. And then he said, but actually it didn't mean no. So all the files were gone. Work. Who knows how much work? Terrible. So you better be meticulous. So the inner guide is telling us, be meticulous. Go to the Guru. Go to the Bhagavatam class. Go to the lecture. Go to the Arctic. Put your hands in your japa. And now start. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. O oh, Divine Lord, you and your name is the all in all. And whatever other service Guru Deva wants me to do, it's you, your name, my Guru, the Vaishnavas, and here is your humble, little, teeny, little, stupid devotee. And wants to be, become a good boy. 
It's <laughs> not going to give trouble to anyone. That's me, who I want to be. <laughs> so, Krishna seen a guide. He's giving us the right impulse. He's protecting us. Anybody who gets to know Krishna consciousness, he agrees with all these things. Well, how could you disagree with the absolute? How could you disagree? Like, for example, I often use that in my preaching. I say, it doesn't matter who you talk to, a Chinese, an indigenous person, an American. You put all of them, like from all races in the world. Now we say a few key questions. Do you like to take an animal and torture it? No, 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 no. Do you think it's nice to have sex, have a child, and let it see for itself what to eat later? No, 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 no. Nobody says yes. And I can give you like a long list of questions where everybody from the world will say no or yes, respectively, because the inner guy tells them. Hmm? Which doesn't mean that people in, in the practical world always follow what the inner guide says. But the inner guide is a secure, that's why Srila Sridhar used to say, that the truth and common sense, they're intimately united. A, a pure devotee is, is not saying abstract things, contradictory things, which puts you in jeopardy and problems. The devotee is always going to tell you nice things, good things, beneficial things. You just have to follow. That's the other side of it. Don't go away from love. Don't do the wrong thing. Go in the direction of the inner guide. What the inner guide is saying, the inner guide never tells you, be irreligious. No. So that's the proof of the inner guide. But then there's more to the inner guide. It's where our particular personal spiritual path goes. Where our inner guide is sending us. Like one time, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, I think was his quote. We have come to the Guru... On Sri Ramaj quoted that. We have come to the Guru by the grace of our inner guide. And if our inner guide now offers and says, but now the mission of my Guru is some other, it's not livable, it's not... Nothing happens here right. I have to follow my guru and my inner guide to my full heart satisfaction. But here at this moment, I can't for some reason. Then shall you ignore your inner guide at that point? No. So then you have to go ahead and find a new situation. It happened to me several times in my life. Very strange. I didn't want that. I didn't want to leave one spiritual organization to join another. I never had. Actually, I never wanted to join any organization. I just wanted to serve my guru and serve the truth, serve my ideals. I wanted to fight for my ideals. I never believed much in any institution, even though they are a little bit uh, like uh, they're kind of a, like an unavoidable thing for certain functions. If I don't have an institution here, I can't have a temple here. So we are very joyful here in Vindakunja, and there's a certain protection because it's not a private... If this would be a private place, like some of the temples here, they're private, and they all of a sudden tell you, get out, we don't want you here anymore. whole thing is over. Something like that happens with private properties all the time. So much that brothers and sisters... They fight over titles, and as soon as they got the title, they kick out the other person. <laughs> Brothers and sisters. Ah, the least ones who should give bad treatment to each other, according to the Vedic tradition. But this is what's happening in this world. So we need this kind of institution sometimes for protecting certain little projects and steps. But nevertheless, I had to leave, leave certain environments because they were just not favorable to spiritual advancement according to my understanding and ideals. And I followed them. And what did I gain? I gained the association of more pure devotees. That's how I met Srila Bhakti Rakaksila much. Without having made this move of following my heart, I would not have come in a close association. I would have missed out 
84 to 88, four years of the wonderful love and guidance of a pure devotee of Krishna. So I'm, I'm not complaining. And so and so. So, but it is a, it's a very difficult decision sometimes to make, to know where do I go, where do I belong, what is the best for me to do. Of course, if your guru is alive, you have no problem, you just ask him. And you get your full satisfaction from him direct. And then he'll tell you, this is what you're supposed to do, this is the way you're supposed to go. And your heart will confirm, yes, it's right. Because if the guru says something, your heart says, no, and then you're in trouble. <laughs> then you're in trouble. And you have to re reevaluate everything. You have to pass the whole thing, your mind, your, your predisposition, everything you have to reevaluate. Where is the mistake? How could my inner heart says no when my, when my Diksha Guru, for example, says yes? Anyhow, there's always a solution because the truth is one. So it's just a question of, of learning. So Krishna is the inner guide. Krishna is the star. Hey, wait a second. Who is in your heart? Is there anybody else guiding you except Krishna? Think about it. You have an inner guide. He's Krishna. Celebrate him. I mean, whatever he's called, it doesn't really matter, does it? Important is that you've got an inner guy. Somebody's living inside of you. And that somebody loves you more than you can imagine. Otherwise, why would he love? Why, why, why would he want to be within you? Why, why would he want to guide you? He's not enjoying you. On the contrary, he's probably suffering when you do nonsense. You have an inner guide. Krishna is our inner guide. Krishna is the guru. He's the guru living inside of us. Hmm? Hare Krishna. This is amazing. Another reason to jump and dance and say, Hare Bol, Hare Bol, Hare Bol, Hare Bol. I pray to you, my inner guide. Please guide me on the way to light. Go to you, to your lotus feet, serving you forever. That's all I need. There's nothing else in my existence I want to do except serving your devotees. So, this is something so incredible. Krishna is full of love. And Krishna is out of his love, is in your heart, as your guide. And when you pray to him, he brings you to the Guru. And the Guru takes you to the devotees. You really want to serve the truth? You want to serve me? Yes, Guru Deva. So then you serve these devotees. No, I was thinking of serving you just directly. But sorry. You have to serve here because service is service. Service is not what you say. Say, and some people say, "Oh, Guru Dev, I would like to travel around with you all the time and help you pay my tickets." <laughs> Something like that. We're well, not a very practical uh, proposal because the Guru is a is a is a traveling mendicant. So first, you have to become a beggar if you want to serve the Guru appropriately. Jet-setting uh, sannyasis, that wasn't the standard of the past, right? So how would they get around? Walking? They would walk. Going to Rasa Yatra every year, there was a walk from Bengal to Puri. Almost a thousand kilometers. Good walk. And they would walk for, and then go back to see their families. So they were determined. They were hard working because on the way they had to take some money or some food. But how are you going to eat for such a long walk? A thousand kilometers? So they had a good economy. Otherwise, how could they have done it? At least they had a perfect administration because they weren't going around like gundas stealing from everywhere on the way. <laughs> they were preachers. They were lovers. So incredible. So this was the tradition. That's why in India there's a very strong tradition which is called Madhukari. If a sannyasi, a real person, a real sincere person comes to your door, you know, what happens then? You give him a little prashana, you invite him for a meal, and you feel very fortunate that you can attend somebody who's coming here to your door like this. So this is a very nice system, you know, spiritual life is just an incredible way of looking upon life. It's very sweet. 
And it's out of, in our culture, everything's I, me, mine. Don't get too close to me. And if you get close to me, it's only for me to check out what I can take from you. No, 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 no. Krishna is our inner guide. Krishna is our most beloved Lord. Krishna is our all in all. Krishna is love. And we are his, supposed to become the instrument of his love.